Um, so yeah, this is um, <clears throat> this is me. My name is Michael. I'm in my first year of my PhD, and uh, I'm supervised by uh, Jenny McRitchie, if anyone knows her, and uh, also by uh, Professor Guy Brown, who's the computer scientist, who I will be badgering loads over the next few months. And this is my project, AI enabled accessible musical instruments for people living with dementia and associated uh, cognitive and motor impairments. So I've spent the last few months trying to answer this question, what should an AI enabled music instrument or interface actually do? And in order to an answer that, I've had to first answer these questions, or at least try to answer these questions. What the effects of dementia are, uh, what the benefits of music are for this population, and how can music be utilised in order for set benefits to be reaped? Is there a work framework I can work with, essentially? And how could an AI-enabled instrument support this? So to hopefully keep to time, I will assume, like Asher, that I am preaching to the converted regarding the benefits of music, so I'm not gonna talk about that. I'll just briefly whiz through uh, the effects of dementia and then tell you about the framework that I've decided to, uh, that I've chosen to work from. And i give you my plan for an AI-enabled uh, musical interface. I am still in draft 1.0, so please don't ask me any difficult questions. Uh, so, uh, yeah, although most people and uh, clip up search engines associate dementia with uh, learning and memory impairments, in fact, dementia is an umbrella term that incorporates a huge number of diseases and so these are characterised by a bunch of uh, several um, uh, impairments in different neurocognitive domains including complex attention, which affects information processing, language and so forth. And dementia is also associated with uh, motor impairments in, uh, which uh, have to do with sort of impaired balance and gait and finger dexterity, which is correlated with dementia severity. Um, and uh, most people living with dementia also present with uh, behavioral and psychological symptoms, which is a fancy way of saying that uh, people feel depressed or apathetic or uh, are bored. Uh, and although these are often medicated for, uh, a lot of researchers are now suggesting that it's, these are reasonable reactions to life, uh, to life uh, circumstances changing. And there's an argument for prioritising non-pharmacological approaches, and music is a huge part of that. And related to that, something that comes up a lot in the literature is that people living with dementia want to be engaged in meaningful activities. <clears throat> and they want to be treated and known as individuals beyond their diagnosis which again, even though it seems common sense, somebody has to say it. So to return to my questions, the implications arising from considering the effects of dementia for me means that I need to take into account the cognitive impairments, motor impairments of which uh, with the declining finger dexterity and the need for meaning, the absence of which is linked to uh, psychological distress. distress. Uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna preach to the converted about the benefits of music, so. I'm going to jump straight to the framework that I've adopted for my project. Thank you for laughing at my visual joke. Um, so this framework, uh, being in the moment, was put forth by Kiri et al. in the University of Manchester, and it's based on the understanding that people living with dementia live from moment to moment uh, within a continuum of moments. In this approach, meaningful experiences can be framed as meaningful moments. Uh, and the process is broken down into these four sequential steps of creating, being in, ending, and reliving the moment. Uh, a moment it can be created by responding, for the person with dementia, it can uh, be created by responding to something that stirs a memory, uh, or via a relational interaction with another person. Uh, relatedly, being in the moment can exist and be sustained within the context of a relational or interactive process. And ending the moment can be quite sudden, can be initiated by the person living with dementia. Uh, and finally, the reliving the moment uh, sort of final step re uh, refers to opportunities to recall the moment afterwards. Uh, but the moment is the first three steps that are most relevant to my work. So since starting my PhD in October, I've been visiting community support groups around Sheffield, armed with my iPad and a rolly block uh, light pad. 
and getting to know people living with dementia and just playing with them, having fun. Uh, and I observed that people who did not play an instrument previously were quite keen to uh, experiment and enjoy themselves more than those who previously played. So they clearly didn't have an expectation of how they should approach this, which was interesting to observe. Uh, I also observed uh, that a little bit of modelling on my part was enough. Just me kind of tapping a couple of notes on the key on the iPad block was enough to get them going. Uh, I found that even the most reluctant takers would join and be in the moment with me if I used sort of a call and response approach where I would play a thing, they would play a thing, and then we would have this conversation uh, with music. And uh, finally, due to the design paradigm of using squares and lights to denote the notes, which is used by a bunch of different applications, um, anxieties regarding getting it right were even further reduced because people could just hit the lights. Um, so I've come up with a draft AI plan, keeping in mind the different impairments of dementia, uh, the observations that I've made, and the framework of Kedia Taos being in the moment. And the plan is this, to have a sort of call and response mode of interaction as the core, and then some form of generative composition to achieve the goal of creating and sustaining an extended moment with music. So I'll take you through each step the way I'm, I'm envisioning it will work. Uh, so the idea is that the user first chooses an instrument. Uh, that instrument will dictate the sound palette for the session. Uh, then the compositional model would draw a sound from that palette and spit out a melody, the core. Uh, starting quite simply, one or two notes perhaps, uh, and then wait for the user to respond. When the user responds, sorry, the call will serve two purposes, sorry, it's to invite the user into creating a moment and to model how to interact. Essentially, I'm trying to build myself into an AI um, so that all the user has to display. So the call and response will feed the AI data on two things, which is speed, uh, by which the user is interacting and the reach of their movement uh, to bring back the declining finger dexterity. Uh, so the idea is that the speed will sort of tell the AI to either slow down or speed up. Um, and the reach will tell the, the AI to maybe reduce the number of available notes. So uh, for example, uh, you can have one note, one button, or you can have all the way up to 25 notes with tiny little buttons. So the idea is to go between those depending on how the user is um, interacting with it. All the while, the uh, composition model will be building an accompaniment, utilising sounds from the palette to underpin this call and response. And finally, the interaction will be brought, brought to a close in some way. Um, so at the moment, my plan is for one person, but the ideal is that this enables two or more people to play together. Um, so. As this doesn't exist, I've mocked up a video, which is complete fakery, but hopefully it will give you an idea of how this might work. So that would be the AI say playing.
So now I have a bunch of questions. I did my draft, I was super happy about it. And then the next day, I was like, well, I now need to consider what sounds to actually offer as options. I can't have 128 instruments for people to choose from. I need to understand how to relate the choice of instrument to the sound palette. Again, I can't have an unlimited number of instruments. Um, regarding the composition model, I need to understand how to build and release tension and complexity and how to utilize uh, rhythm perception and entrainment to create rhythm and uh, temporal cohesion and guide the user accordingly, and how to bring the moment to an end. And my final destination, how to use this in order to enable a group of people to play together. And that's kind of it. At the moment, uh, I'm, I'm in my early stage, so any, anything that jumps at you that you think, oh, you should use this, please tell me. Because I'm at that point. Um, so yeah, that is it. Any questions or suggestions or feedback? Raise your arm in that way, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yes. I used to teach primary, so <laughs> it creeps in, you know. Yeah. Well, it's not really a question, but um, I'm getting big, interesting resonances here. So, um, uh, um, this is uh, Noam Letterman, who's a PhD student at the Open University, yeah. who happens to be a high-level professional drummer. He's been flown out to LA, you know, like every week type thing. And he's been making a drum agent, um, which in fact he designed it to do call and response with high-level professional drummers. Okay who like it, right? And, um, but then he found that um, he tried it with complete beginners. And provided you sort of, you know, kept it, you like, took the temperature down a bit. Um, yeah. Beginners really liked it. And so it's not really a question, but um, I'm just thinking about the role of rhythm, you know, and um, the power of call and response. and. What a wonderful application area. Sorry, so it's not really a question. No, that's, uh, that's yeah. great, but, but that's, I meant to get in touch with you anyway about polyphonia. Oh, okay. <laughs> and see how I might be able to use some of that in my Fantastic. compositional model. Well, it made me think that too, but yeah. uh, anyway, thanks. That's very good. Thank you, sir. I think Asha, back. Yeah, it's Asha. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in the fact that you have been working with Changes all the time, it can be a bit confusing as to what it's supposed to do. So, there might be something about sticking with something for someone um, for a longer period of time, especially you know, considering what you're having to deal with in terms of memory. Uh, and the other thing was the thing that I ended up with that was one of the greatest moments was with um, somebody who was triggering something that was already like a piece of sound that already existed, it was the Mamma Mia song. So, they were doing chord response with the music therapist. Yeah. I had two tiny snippets of the samples on the buttons, and they, the music therapist was able to play and they were back and forth with that. So I don't know if there's something about particularly with the older people and, and the types of music that trigger them. You make this when you're taking some of those snippets of those samples. I've uh, tried that. That's super cool. I, I've considered like creating like sampled instruments based on like snippets of music that people like. Um, but it's it's interesting that the uh, the specific population there's a lot done with like reminiscence and like rehashing the past. Sometimes it's comforting, but I think there's I don't know. I I am also also trying to consider when to approach when to, when to go down that route or when to go south down a completely different route of meeting them where they are. Yeah. Which seems, uh, but yeah, it's thing, things to consider. Oh, hi, everybody. Yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> Karina yeah. here. Yeah. Um, again, thinking about the types of, like, I guess, compositional devices, call responses, and the, the classic, and you would use that first always. Um, 
But then thinking what, what we were saying about music therapy and the way music therapists interact with people, people one to one, mm -hmm. and um, Tony Wigram's work about the types of interactions, so you could have. Um, you play something with a ferret with your client that might function as a kind of grounding thing, you might mirror them, so there's different types of using what they do and reflecting it back in different ways. So there's a whole big list of categories of see if I can find the paper just now, but you know, just to extend the types of things you're asking the AI to do. Just a thought. Thank you, Anna, for making me think of more things. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you're great. Well, yeah, no, it's quite useful. Thank you. So we are over time, but are there have we got time for another one more quick question? Yeah. One thing that can be really powerful is sampling somebody's own voice or kind of literally a sound in the room that they're in. I know you've done that quite a bit. I've worked with quite a lot of children who actually you can sample their voice or a voice of their family or somebody and then turn that into a musical sound. There's something cognitively very deep that recognises it, even when a lot of the comprehension seems to have been yeah, yeah. But the idea of sampling kind of saying and turning that into an instrument could be, very, it makes it very personal. It really does, Pete, I love that, I am going to use that. And it means you can train the AI on that voice too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, thank you so much, that's uh, great, great feedback. Uh, thank you guys. Brilliant. Well, thanks everybody. Oh, one thing that I noticed, I think, about the AI is how kind of personal it is and how kind of intimate these kinds of interactions are, which is not a thing that I would have expected of this kind of technology. So I think it's a really interesting kind of thing that I just I, I noticed, and, and you know, it's, it's a, that's not what I'd expect. So I think it gives it a lot of scope, you know, for doing this kind of work. It's great, really interesting. Thanks, everybody. Can we have a round of applause for the speakers?